Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Skylar Earl. Uh, I am here to uh, share with you the activities of the Humanitarian Open Street Map Team. Uh, so, uh, Humanitarian Open Street Map Team, or HOT, or HOT as we call it for short, uh, is a nonprofit organization dedicated to supporting humanitarian work with open data and open software. We are an a incorporated 501c3 organization in the United States uh, with uh, tax deductible donation status. Um, so feel free to give us your money. Uh, the Mikkel, when was the organization founded? It was 2008, nine? Right. So this is Mikkel Marin. Uh, he is the president of the board of directors of the Humanitarian Open Street Map team. Hello, Mikkel. Um, and uh, uh, Mikkel is going to uh, discuss some of the things that we have to present today. And then we have uh, some other participants in HOT projects who are also going to share a few words about the work that they've done. Uh, uh, why don't we save that, actually, because we're going to dig in very shortly into the topics I wanted to ho have you discuss. Uh, so uh, so uh, HRT is about the, the union of uh, open street map and humanitarian work. So uh, we do crisis response. You know, we, we respond to humanitarian crises around the world with remote mapping activities. Uh, we work on humanitarian risk reduction. So we try, uh, where possible, we uh, work with uh, humanitarian agencies uh, to try to map places before disasters happen. Uh, and we do technical capacity building. So we also try to work with communities around the world to build their technical chops uh, so that they can um, be more productive and proactive in mapping their own communities. And we do it all with OpenStreetMap, which is super exciting. Uh, so our, our prints, we work with a set of principles as follows. Um, our main principles that we work with open data and open software. Um, we believe passionately in the power of open data to make the world a better place. Um, we try to provide services to humanitarian responders. Um, it is of the utmost importance to us that we, that we work with local knowledge and local culture in the, the, the um, foreign countries that we work in. Uh, and uh, we try to work quickly and efficiently. And uh, we're trying to be open to collaboration and partnerships. We feel that uh, the humanitarian open street map team is sort of one of the one of the outward faces of the open street map community to the world, and we want to try to evangelize the use of OSM uh, in as many communities as possible. Uh, so our activities are as follows: we do field projects. Uh, so usually we do. Uh, we'll actually send teams of uh, people from the Humanitarian Open Street Map team out into the world, uh, usually hand in hand with some international organization like the Red Cross or the World Bank, um, and meet with uh, communities of people in those places and uh, usually do trainings um, and, and do mapping workshops uh, in order to start building up technical capacities in those parts of the world. Uh, we also do remote mapping, so we'll try to marshal volunteers to map distressed parts of the world from the comfort of their own home. Um, our most notable work in this was uh, after the earthquake in Haiti, um, but, but we've done actually a lot of remote mapping ac um, uh, activation since then. And then finally, we also do software development. Uh, the HOT is an active participant in the OpenStreetMap software ecology, and we've developed several, uh, several applications that are um, and tools that are customized to the humanitarian use cases. Uh, and then last, we also do co community organizing, uh, both within OSM and, uh, and, and within uh, communities which we are encouraging to pick up OpenStreetMap. Um, so we, again, like I said, we try to evangelize the use of the project there. So uh, our field projects, uh, both completed and ongoing. Mikkel, would you mind, um, I mean, I'll run through the slides, but would you mind sort of talking about each of these projects? Uh, and then, like I said, we also have participants uh, in some of these projects here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so uh, if you're here and you have worked on a hot project, um, so I guess Amy, uh, is Eureka here? Eureka, please come and join us. And then uh, did, did Pressler want to speak, yeah. say a few words? Yeah, Pressler, if you, if you come and join us, please. Um, hi, it's nice to meet you. Um, so anyway, uh, okay, so ooh, what happened there? Um, okay, so one, one project which is not adequately represented here but is badly typoed is um, uh, AUSAID. We've, we've done a project with the um, Australia um, Aid, Aid and Development Agency uh, in Indonesia. This is one of our flagship projects. It's gone on for quite a while. Um, and this is uh, our executive director, Kate Chapman, has been working with university students uh, in Indonesia to basically map remote villages um, before uh, uh, earthquakes or tsunamis hit. Um, we've also done uh, huge projects with uh, USAID in Haiti. Um, Amy, do you want to speak to that? Cool, yeah. 
thanks so much for having us here this weekend. Uh, I'm Amy Norell from uh, USAID. That's the U.S. Agency for International Development, the Office of Transition Initiatives. And uh, we work in about 15 countries across the world supporting peaceful and democratic transitions, and um, be that leading up to a political moment or also after natural disasters. And so that's really our entree into Haiti. Uh, we have had a program ongoing there since January 2010. And we've been very proud and excited to support the work of the Humanitarian Open Street map team, as well as a local organization of voluntary mappers, um, COSMA, and I believe you have um, some people here today who can help me represent that group. Uh, we have funded mapping projects uh, in St. Mark and Cap Haitian. Those are two of the USG's development corridors in Haiti. And so we have helped to fill in the blank spaces on the map as well as make updates to uh, the humanitarian data model, which you can find on the wiki. And then also in terms of um, providing some new map running for that humanitarian data model. And there's also the hot export tool, if you guys want to Google that. Um, OK, great. That sounds fabulous. So I think um, without further ado, I'll introduce some other folks who can speak about Haiti as well. Thanks. I say hello to everyone. So I don't speak English very well, but I must speak to <laughs> to talk uh, for OpenShift Map. So we just come with a friend. Uh, we present to OpenStreetMap AED, COSMA, Community OpenStreetMap, but Michelin, you can come. So my name is Bressler. I work with uh, OpenStreetMap in AED until 2010, after the earthquake. We must a lot of work with the data OpenStreetMap. So when you finish on the full mission to take the data, you use the data in IGS or QGIS to make some thematics map. You use uh, a lot of imagery to do this, you use the imagery of you have uh, and being, you use the, the imagery of you have, you know, the drone, so to make some analysis map. Uh, the situation uh, you have uh, an, an AD, we have some teams in each department, like say Amy, uh, to to involve uh, the activities of OpenStreetMap. Um, after the disaster of SNZ, we make a good things at Bidboy area. So we, we need to have information in this area after the earthquake. You use the map, open sheet map to map the, all this area. You show all, all the things. You use the new imagery to make some analysis to show the building damage. And you use uh, the, the assessment to make all the things to see the object humanitarian you lost after the earthquake. So this kind of work give a lot of, have a lot of importance in AD. So we want to develop a lot of things like web mapping to help the cartography to be to be well in AD and to make the communication to 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 allow people know the the power of, of these tools. So come, Michelangelo, if you want to say some things to about AD. Uh, hi everybody. Is the same thing for me? Uh, my English is not very well. Uh, yes. Uh, as I as I so as uh, Presley told, we try to improve the all the activities of OpenStreetMap in Haiti, because there's uh, a lot of thing, a lot of uh, uh, problem we could identify, and we try to put all this information on the map, just to show to everyone uh, there is the situation, what can we do, and how can help and to to resolve some uh, problem of environmental uh, etc this is uh, what i have to say and if so we have a presentation i don't know if we if we could have the time to uh, maybe okay maybe, maybe you can um, later if okay. May, maybe after the after class I can talk okay so you can just maybe okay okay. Yeah. okay thank you uh, we we have a lot of possibility. We have the the representative of BA Week. We uh, we here. You can come. So today, when you come, you see you can use the the imagery of UAV, the new imagery, and the and the rest of that. Yes. Should work. So unexpected pleasure. Very well. 
is can give you some context there. There you go. Give All right, now this is this, this is, is UAV imagery. This is their UAV imagery, and this nice. is overlaid on top of OSM data. Um, just so you guys know who I am, we have a booth downstairs. Uh, we have a map rendering technology. And these guys were asking us, could they, could we show their UAV imagery? And we were like, of course. So uh, if you zoom in here, I guess this is uh, this is actually streaming from their WMS server. And uh, you can see the OS, I've just uh, alpha alpha blended the OSM data onto this for them so you can get an idea where the streets are. But they have they have some UAV UAV data around Haiti. I guess this was recent. So it might look better if I turn it sideways. Would that help? Yeah, you can control it. For example, here we have a river. You see after the earthquake uh, all the river become very large. So give a lot of trouble. So the rivers are all washed out. Yes, yes. And um, it, the imagery actually looks a little better than this because I have a map on top of this. If I turn that off, um, let me just turn off the OSM layer here. So it's a little richer in color than you see here. And it's pretty pretty remarkable for UAV that you know these things are relatively inexpensive and allow them to fly these things every day if they want to. What's the image? Uh, four, four centimeters. Nice. Four, What's four centimeters. Yeah. You you can have you can have the opportunity to have the dam into the this this imagery. With ten centimeters you have the dam. Okay. If you want to make some analysis map for ideology, you have the dam but you can find it in this imagery. After you finish to make the processing. Looks like another washed out river here. So that flooding is pretty bad over there. Thanks for letting me show you guys this and I hope this helped out a little Thank bit. Here I'll you can yeah, you can disconnect that. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Okay, so uh, that's a little bit of detail about the Haiti project. Um, I mean, we've had a a, a pretty long um, and ongoing engagement with uh, with the OSM community in Haiti, um, and they've made incredible progress, as you can see. Uh, come on. There we go. Uh, okay, um, we've also uh, worked with uh, with Eurotia in several countries in Central Africa. Uh, Eureka, would you like to g uh, say a few words about the the work that you personally did on the Eurotia project? Hi, I'm uh, Eureka. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> okay, I'm Eureka, and uh, I was part of the the Eurotia project. The Eurosha project uh, was a project financed by the U European Commission, and it was a uh, hot was one of the organizations who was supporting the project, uh, with uh, with nine other European NGOs. The project was in big. It was in a to begin uh, a group of um, European people, volunteers, and local volunteers divided in four in four different African countries. So it's. Kenya, Chad, the Central African Republic, and Burundi oh also. Right yeah. And uh, personally, me, I was deployed uh, for six months normally in the Central African Republic, right in the center of Africa. <laughs> and um, there we promote uh, two open source tools, Sahana Eden and uh, OpenStreetMap, uh, to improve the actions of humanitarian organizations on the field in times of crisis. And, um, but the main, the main uh, tool we promoted was OpenStreetMap with the, with the help of the humanitarian, humanitarian OpenStreetMap team. And um, uh, yeah, our main activities were uh, collecting data, promoting OpenStreetMap as a tool for humanitarian organizations and giving trainings to, uh, to, several, to, several, to all the interested people. This means uh, local NGOs, this means uh, organizations from the United Nations like UNICEF, this means universities, this means uh, just uh, s students, all the people who were interested in, uh, in OpenStreetMap or are using uh, the data for it, we trained, uh, we did a lot of trainings, for example, with, um, with the town hall of Bangui, Bangui is the, the capital of Central African Republic, um, and with the, with the Ministry of Water and Forest, so we did a lot of trainings with it. Um, also, we collect by ourselves because we were a team of uh, five European people and two local people. 
so we we could manage to collect a lot of data and map by ourselves uh, uh, a lot of a lot of uh, yeah. Uh, we were staying in the capital, so our focus was the capital too, because also the the other parts of the country were too dangerous to to travel around. Um, and in the capital, we um, we focused uh, on um, on health facilities because there was um, in by the humanitarian actors there was a high need to to see where actually the health facilities are, where are the hospitals, how many what. What's the capacity of the hospital? What the the little health centers? Where where are they? What what kind of uh, what kind of, of what can they offer to the patients? So it was really was highly important for uh, the local NGOs and, and organizations to uh, to improve their data on on this. So we focused on that, and yeah, um, and there was. Um, because of one, uh, normally our time was six months in the Central African Republic, but after three months, after uh, after two months, there were there was a kind of rebellion group who was coming up, who was coming to threat the regime in the Central African Republic. So um, around around two and a half months later, three months, we uh, we had we were evacuated to Cameroon because it was too dangerous, they couldn't ensure our security anymore. So uh, we had to move. <laughs> and uh, at that moment, the rebels were not taken over the regime yet, but they were coming really closely to, to the capital with all difficulties in the other, the other, the other parts of the country. So we, we had to move, and we moved to Cameroon. So in the beginning, we were seeing how to handle with the situation? Can we go back to Central African Republic? What are we, what are we going to do? And uh, after we decided to stay in Cameroon for three months, because the project was in total six months, so we st uh, we stayed in Cameroon to focus on uh, the far north origin, uh, regi region, because uh, there they have a uh, lot of troubles with floodings, and they also can use the data collection, and. Uh, yeah, we also supported because our two local colleagues were staying in the Central African Republic. We supported. We keep on kept on supporting them, and uh, yeah, at the end of our mission, it was uh, in March, I think almost. The rebel, the rebels uh, of Seleka is the rebel group. Uh, they took over the regime in uh, in Central African Republic, and um, there was. It was really a kind of war zone in uh, in Bangui, in the Central African Republic, and um, we were at that moment still in uh, in Cameroon. And then we got uh, uh, phones and emails from, for example, UN OCHA, to get information. What were you doing? What were you doing again in, in with OpenStreetMap? And uh, what was it again? <laughs> and and then we could, with our, all our collected data of health centers. We could ev they effectively use the data on to improve, to distribute medical kits, for example, to all the health centers. And so I think for me, there it's not easy to work in a human in a context like that. But I think it's useful. It's very useful. And I think, yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you so yeah. much. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, so as you can see, like this, the the experience of yeah, it's no, that was that was great. Thank you. The as you can see, the the, the challenges of working in the field are. Um, often immense, uh, and um, the the volunteers and the staff members of the humanitarian open stream map team often go through quite a quite a lot in order to complete their work. But I think it's it's always rewarding for everyone to to know that you know you're able to make a difference. To know that when you map you know clinics in a you know in the capital of Central African Republic that you know, the UN is going to be able to use those maps, the, you know, only a few months later. Um, okay, so we have some other projects that are um, in, in the early phase. Uh, we have a, a project similar to the one that was uh, done with Eurotia, um, with the uh, International Organization for Francophonie, um, in Senegal, Burkina Faso, Togo, and Chad. And then uh, we have another project that's similar to the Indonesia project, uh, working with um, universities and local communities to help uh, train students and, and build capacity uh, in Sri Lanka and Bangladesh. Do you have anything to add about those projects? Um, I guess um, for Open Cities, it's with uh, the World Bank Global Facility for Disaster Risk Reduction. It's a little bit of a different model. Um, it is based a lot of, around the Indonesia work for doing disaster preparedness. Um, these, these are countries which are regularly faced with uh, with crises, with, with natural disaster. 
Um, but it's a little bit of a different model in that HOT's involvement is a little bit more hands-off. Um, so the lead from HOT, is, who is experienced, is Jeff Heck, who's um, worked in Indonesia and did things like write Learn OSM in a weekend. Uh, he will only be in each location for two weeks, and then he has a, like a remote mentorship role with the local folks in these locations. We haven't worked that way before, so it's kind of an ex it's nice to have an experiment to see both how we can cover more areas and really scale up, scale or replicate more, because we're a limited number of, of folks, you know, even within the whole OpenStreetMap community. Um, but also to build more uh, local community support and leadership from the start. So it's it's a great that we can try that out. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so I in addition to uh, working out in the field, we do a great deal of um, uh, remote mapping activations. Uh, so uh, in in the last few months, the humanitarian open street map team uh, has done uh, um, remote response, which is to say we get basically we'll, we'll try to get imagery of a, of a place that's in trouble um, and uh, uh, marshal volunteers usually on the humanitarian open street map team mailing list. Um, we also use uh, Wiki and IRC as a way of communicating. Um, we'll try to get volunteers to essentially map the imagery. Um, and this is often in, request, uh, in response to requests from international organizations who need more detailed map data of the places that they're trying to serve. Uh, so as you know, there was a civil war in Mali this year. We did some mapping of some cities there. Uh, I think we've done mapping in, in Syria in response to the civil war there. It's interesting, in the past few years, Humanitarian Open Street Map Team has focused mostly on response to uh, natural disasters. And really, just in the past year, um, we've been called upon to, to respond more to um, unrest uh, as opposed to uh, natural disasters. Um, and uh, yeah, so I've got some images here. Uh, we also worked, uh, done work on Central African Republic and Congo and also Afghanistan. Does, uh, what, what was the response in Afghanistan? Was that just uh, in collaboration with the uh, Red Cross or was that in response to something specific? Because I don't remember. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so anyway, there's a lot going on and sometimes it's a little hard to keep track of. So as you can see, uh, the maps that come out of these activations are often insanely detailed. I mean, there are places in you know the United States and in Europe that don't have this level of detail. So this is uh, the city of Mopti in, I think, um, I think this is in Congo. Uh, we have uh, no, sorry, Mopti is in uh, is in Mali. Um, this is uh, Kichanga in the uh, DRC, uh, and we also have maps of Bangui in uh, Central African Republic. Um, so yeah, so this is very exciting. It's 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 amazing to me how much detail uh, and how much information we can marshal uh, just from folks like you. Uh, working from the comfort of your own home um, and collaborating in that way. Uh, we also have some technical projects that we're working on, software projects. Uh, we have a tasking service, uh, which we use uh, to manage uh, collaboration on remote mapping activations. I'll show you some screenshots of that in a minute. Uh, we also maintain an export tool, mostly for use by our partners, I would say, to export data from uh, OpenStreetMap's somewhat idiosyncratic data format into formats that partner organizations are more familiar with using. Um, and for that, we also use the humanitarian data model, which is a common data model that we're promoting across different organizations to allow humanitarian organizations to share uh, open geo data in a more sensible fashion. Um, we're working on building a tool that allows people to kind of customize how the export tool works. Um, we've got custom uh, JOSM map styling that's tailored to the humanitarian data model. Uh, and somewhat separately, we started a project called MapMill. It was actually building on work done by Public Laboratory for Open Technology and Science. Um, and we use this to here in the United States, actually, uh, to help people uh, marshal a uh, response to Hurricane Sandy, actually, to, to tag aerial photographs, um, oblique aerial photographs, um, not to trace them, but actually just to identify how much damage is shown in this photo, and that the data was aggregated and used by FEMA uh, to help allocate response assets. Uh, so this is what the tasking manager looks like. As you can see, we have individual tasks, usually in response to a particular activation, um, and then each task has a grid. And that grid allows us to, essentially, you can check out a grid cell and, and load that into JOSM. And then you're saying, like, I'm going to work on this grid cell. And then you, when you check it back in, you can say this is done or it's started, but it's incomplete. Um, and so we can use this to, uh, to kind of gather all of the information necessary to participate in a hot remote map mapping activation into one place uh, and then track people's work. So uh, this is an example of a tool that we've had to develop for our own purposes, because nothing like it really existed before. 
because nothing like the humanitarian open stream map team has, has really existed before. Uh, and so in that sense, the tasking manager represents the way in which uh, we as an organization, as part of the wider open stream map community, are really kind of out on the cutting edge in terms of how open map data is used in the real world. Um, this is a screenshot of map mill. Uh, this is um, damage along the Jersey Shore, I think. Um, and as you can see here, we created a very simple crowdsourcing interface. So we're not making maps here. We're just trying to identify. These are photographs that are taken by uh, the Civil Air Patrol, which is the U.S. Air Force Auxiliary, civilian auxiliary. And uh, in the event of natural disasters in the United States, they put Cessnas in the air with digital SLR cameras, a little GPS widget. And so they take literally thousands, tens of thousands of these kind of oblique aerial photographs. And it's like FEMA doesn't have the Federal Emergency Management Agency. They, they just don't have the manpower to look at all of these photos and make sense out of them. And that's where we come in, right? So we've uh, tried to, to um, kind of marshal the, the uh, humanitarian open street map team for a slightly different purpose. Um, but, but the end goal is the same, right? That we're trying to produce, use and produce open data to support humanitarian response. Uh, within the organization itself, in addition to our field projects and our remote activities, um, we, and software projects, we also have working groups. Uh, so we have an activation working group that's sort of working on delineating the terms on which the team responds to different crisis situations. Uh, we have a technical working group that's uh, trying to manage the hosting of the services that we're building, like the tasking manager. Uh, we have a security working group, and this is still a very new thing, but uh, we, we've realized that it's actually super important for us to begin to understand the security challenges and risks both to hot volunteers and also to the local communities that we work with and be really proactive about ensuring uh, first and foremost the safety of everybody involved uh, with the humanitarian open street map team both directly and indirectly. Uh, we also have a strategic working group which is trying to deal with sort of the longer range issues of how we want uh, uh, HOT to evolve as an organization. Uh, and then we have a membership working group which is sort of trying to uh, delineate the, the, the sort of responsibilities and the um, the, the kind of activities of our membership. Right now we have, uh, as, an or, as a nonprofit organization incorporated in the United States, we have a formal membership with a board of directors. We have about like 40 some odd members, is that right? And, uh, and then of course we have, a, we have a, a, a wider community of people who are uh, you know, on the hot mailing list and, and who participate in the work that we're doing. So the challenges, um, I mean just to touch on these briefly because we're basically out of time. Uh, you know, there's a tension between doing sort of projects and doing activations. Uh, the remote activations, I would say, like crisis response is intrinsically more glamorous than uh, kind of disaster preparedness. Uh, and so there's a way in which uh, crisis response is easier because people want to come out and they want to participate and devote a little bit of time. Uh, whereas the projects that we do require sustained engagement in order to really have an impact on the international communities that we're trying to support. Uh, and, so, and so they tend to be, uh, uh, in some ways, a more grueling affair. Um, and there are ways in which the projects and the activations, because they have such different concerns, they kind of pull us in different directions as an organization. And I feel like uh, ultimately this is really healthy, but it's, it's definitely one of the challenges that we face. Um, and, and in a similar fashion, there's sort of this question of, well, do we focus on response? Do we focus on preparedness? Preparedness, um, and how much do we want to focus on uh, uh, kind of international development, like economic development, as one way of helping people to promote stability in their communities so that they're more resilient in the face of disasters. And so this is actually kind of goes even further than preparedness into, you know, how do we help people um, address issues of their own economic development and, and do we, how much do we want to focus on that, possibly to the exclusion of preparedness and response? Because as a volunteer driven organization, we have fundamentally, we have capacity issues. Um, you know, we're, we're definitely, uh, we're short on skilled people who have the time and the interest to put into both uh, projects and activations. Um, and we're short on, we, we're relatively short on funding. And this is actually kind of a chicken and egg problem because, um, we feel that the, I mean, the, the team is obviously is, has been around for several years. We have uh, you know, quite a bit of uh, proven success, um, both remotely and in the field. So it shouldn't be too hard for us to get funding, but so far nobody has time to kind of pound the pavement and figure out where uh, money to support the organization itself is going to come from. We get funding for projects, usually from our partners, but those, but those support the field projects. And we'd like to see, uh, we'd like to, we're hoping to work on getting a bit of organization to, uh, getting a little bit of funding to support the organization directly and allow us to expand our capacity. Uh, so the conclusion is, uh, HOT is a thing. Like it's actually, it works. The humanitarian open street map team has, has, has demonstrated success. We've been able to really help people materially um, out in the world. And we've been able to help international organizations help people. It's very exciting. It works. Um, and then most of all, HOT needs your help. Um, we are a volunteer organization. Uh, we, we, I think all of us derive tremendous satisfaction 
uh, from knowing that we're doing work that ultimately is using OpenStreetMap to make the world like tangibly and concretely a better place to really um, you know help both directly and indirectly people who are in need. Um, and, and we need your support because, quite frankly, there are never enough hands to do all of the work uh, that's necessary to make our vision a reality. So I'm hoping that you will uh, will do us the service of uh, getting involved and you know putting your shoulder to the wheel. Uh, so I want to thank you. I want to thank everybody who took the time to present uh, during this session. I'm really grateful for your input. Um, and I want to thank all of the members of the Humanitarian OpenStreetMap team out there and all the members of our community um, because without all of you, we wouldn't be here. So thank you very much. Oh, uh, do we have time for questions? Do we have time for questions? We're actually, I think we're over time. Um, uh, do, all right, well, I, we're going to take, I guess, uh, two questions. First. Ah, that is a very good question. The best thing to do would be to join the mailing list. If uh, You can actually just like search on Google for humanitarian open street map mailing list. Um, but that's the address for the mailing list there. So that's the best thing to do is to sign on the mailing list um, and that will kind of give you some exposure into uh, what our organization does and, and kind of where we need people to plug in because all of the calls for volunteers go out on the mailing list. Uh, do you have any other suggestions? Oh, the, the, sorry, the question was how do you get better involved? And, and the answer is... Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, in terms of remote activations, which is one of the places where we need the most help, you know, if you're interested in getting involved, just jump right in. You know, you can uh, sign into the tasking manager with your uh, OpenStreetMap.org account and start checking out, uh, checking out grid squares. So, yeah, it's really, it should, we're trying to make it as easy as possible for skilled mappers to just jump right in. Um, and the mailing list right now is the best place to find out about our activities. Did you have anything else to add to that? Okay. Uh, all right, one more question, and then we're going to wrap up. All the way in the back. Okay, I, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the, the question is, um, essentially I think the question boils down to sort of how does the humanitarian open street map team decide what kinds of partners to work with? Um, as you point out, we do have a, kind of an emphasis on, um, on I mean, the, what we've talked about mostly is about working with international organizations, but the fact is we always work with local organizations in the field. Like without exception, because I mean, we feel like if, if we're not able to transfer the technology and the, the data and the work that we're doing and the capacity to do that work, then it's, it's kind of a waste of time, honestly. Like mapping other people's communities is, is not, there's a point in that. Um, so yeah, so uh, the, most of the organizations that I talked about are really our funders. Um, and they help support our projects and give them direction. But, but we always, without exception, work with uh, local universities and local nonprofits uh, to try to sort of put them to work mapping their own communities. Um, there is one thing that we've talked about uh, you know, from a strategic level. Um, HRT doesn't work with military. Uh, we've made that, we've sort of made a, a very firm policy decision about that. Uh, you know, if if uh, militaries want to use the data that we're publishing, then, you know, we can't stop them because it's open street map, it's open data. But, but as, as a matter of, of kind of organizational interest, uh, we've decided that we want to focus exclusively on working with, uh, you know, civilian organizations um, because we, we want to sort of sidestep. Even when military, uh, even when military is doing humanitarian work, we prefer that they um, kind of help themselves rather than engaging with them directly. Um, okay, so I think we're now, um, we're now over. Uh, is, uh, where's Dale? Ah, right. So, um, so I, I want to invite you to hang around uh, for Dale's talk because he's going to um, go into a little bit more depth about the work that the Red Cross has been doing. Thank you all very much. <laughs>